These men are different, set apart from other human beings. They have sworn to accept their deaths unconditionally whenever orders or circumstances demand it. And they have taken that oath, given that promise, in the name of the rest of us. They have offered to spare us the horror of confronting the face of battle. War can show a face of glory to the world. No spectacle so touches the emotions as the sight of soldiers arrayed for ceremony. A column of young men in fine uniform turns heads and stirs hearts. Whether they parade to bury a hero, celebrate a victory, or, as on this day, state their readiness to die in the terrible environment of a battlefield. Just south of Brussels is the battlefield of Waterloo. It's an appropriate place from which to observe the changing face of battle. For here, battlefields, ancient and modern, overlap each other like scales of armor. 50 miles northwest lies the sea. 50 miles southeast are the steep, wooded hills of the Ardennes. Waterloo stands astride the corridor in between, a natural invasion route for armies of all ages. At its center rises the Lion Mound, Belgium's monument to the Allied victory and a unique place to look back at the experience of battle. Some miles to the south of me, over there, more than 2,000 years ago, Caesar and his Roman legions fought the Nervii on the banks of the Sambre. Further to the west were the battlefields of Agincourt and Crecy, where English archers cut down the flower of French chivalry in the 14th and 15th centuries. And not far to the east lies Ramillies, where Marlborough and his cavalry won a famous victory 100 years before Waterloo. And 100 years after Waterloo, it was the German army of von Kluck that passed this way, bound for the mud and trenches of Flanders. In the early days of May 1940, from here, you could very well have heard the rumble of the tanks of the 3rd Panzer Division, the northern flank of the German advance that introduced to a startled world the revolutionary concept of Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. So this lion mound is a military vantage point in more than one way. In this program, we can view the actions that took place at different stages throughout the course of that eventful day and compare them directly with the equivalent experience of other battles in other centuries. For war does change, even if the human emotions it touches remain constant and universal. June the 18th, 1815, Napoleon, on the morning of Waterloo, reviewed his army from the ridge which runs opposite the Lion Mound. While Napoleon showed himself to his soldiers, Wellington's men were marching to the ridge on the other side of the valley. Men become soldiers for all sorts of reasons. Roman soldiers served mainly for pay. The word soldier comes from the name of the coin they received. The Muslim soldiers of the Caliphs of Islam were enlisted as slaves of the state. At the start of America's Civil War, the North relied on volunteers. The Tommies of the British Empire soldiered for a shilling a day. Kitchener's armies went to the First World War for patriotism and comradeship. The French went because they owed that duty to the Republic. 
the Germans marched to the Second World War in obedience to the will of the Führer. For the average American conscript who fought the Germans and the Japanese, the aim was to get the job done and get back home. And the British regulars who went to the Falklands were also doing their job as highly trained professionals. Waterloo, and soldiers on both sides waited with mixed feelings for the impending battle. One 16-year-old British infantry officer, George Keppel, spent what he called the dreary interval between daylight and the first cannon shot, constantly wishing that the fight was fought. The urge to have it over and done with seems to afflict all soldiers on the eve of battle. Fear gnaws at them, fear of death of wounds, of showing fear to their comrades. Men draw close, compulsively cleaning their weapons and trying to keep at bay that silence that falls on each little group. You get that waiting, that fear, not fear in itself, but fear of being frightened. You, you are waiting for something to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. In yourself, you're you're waiting, you, you think, am I going to be frightened? It goes through your mind. I don't want to be frightened because if anything goes wrong and I'm scared, I might let my mates down. I was uh, particularly nervy. I'd clean my gun, go off to the toilet, have a meal, have a pick out of the bully beef tin that I didn't really want. But once I was committed, I was a totally different fella. I could, I could carry on then. Once I got moving, I was good. But the night before, no good at all. I went from acute fear the day I got off the plane that landed there to chronic fear that stayed with me the entire time I was there. Acute fear is when you're someone, you feel like someone's going to take your life right away and you're absolutely like this. Uh, ready to respond, and chronic fear becomes kind of a knot in the pit of your stomach. It's there all the time. Um, it never quite ever goes away. It's common language. You get butterflies, you know. They've been working overtime. Even with the power, you carry a parachute on your back, you don't know what will happen. Will it open? Will you arrive safely down? But as soon as the plane left the ground, it was calm then, yeah? But the men, Never, never calmed down because they did. Now, once the doors open and the green light comes on, once it, uh, the order came, stand up. What well, I mean, it was the feeling like either you fill your pants or you jump out. I think I knew I would be frightened, but. Part of that fear is the physical fear of being hit, actually downed. And part of it is failing. And the two sort of balance against each other and help you go on. So prior to it, you're aware of it. I mean, we stood together prior to moving round to the battle in a group, and we all stood close and sort of mumbled together and sort of got confidence. And that, that was fear. But there was also anticipation. Well, you know, it's the one thing we'd all trained for. No one would have not wanted to be there, but nobody really wanted to be there, so it was a very mixed feelings. Got to get it done fast, so the only way to do it is get in there. It's just waiting around is the worst part. But I'll just wait and, wait and go. So we just want to get there and get over and done with. It was like going to a picnic. Everyone was, was happy. It was really amazing that uh, it wasn't like going into a battle at the time until uh, the first shots were fired across the bow of our ships. Then the picnic was no longer there. 
Then came the war. The main action at Waterloo opened with an artillery bombardment when Napoleon's grand battery of 80 guns fired for over half an hour across the valley separating the two armies. And the British artillery replied. Probably more than 2,000 rounds of ammunition were fired in that interval by guns like this one. This happens to be British. It's a bronze six-pounder, meaning that its solid shot weighed six pounds. But it also fired loose shot, canister or grape like this, which was designed to have the same effect upon massed infantry as a shotgun cartridge on a flock of birds. To aim, the number one would simply squint down the barrel. If you wanted to raise or lower, elevate or depress, you could use this. But if you wanted to traverse, he simply used raw muscle. He picked up the hand spike and he pushed and shoved until he was happy. Now, the range of this light six pounder would have been up to 1,200 yards, and the French heavier 12 pounders across the valley up to a mile. At long range, and that's what it was, they'd have been using this solid shot and using it with horrific effect. During the central stage of the battle, the inner skilling regiment was kept under direct fire by the French artillery at a range of 700 yards for four hours. When it marched off, it left 450 of its 750 officers and men dead or wounded in the positions. Ensign Leek of the 52nd Regiment actually saw the ball leave the muzzle of a French gun after its crew had swabbed, loaded and rammed. And he watched it come apparently straight at his face. Well, he debated whether he should duck and decided that honour forbade that, so he drew himself to attention. Well, the ball took off the heads of the four men next to him. No wonder the infantry feared and hated artillery. It was already the great killer of the battlefield. As one war followed another during the century after Waterloo, artillery grew in power and impact. During the American Civil War, it was the terrible guns the survivors of battle recalled. I was never so tired of shelling in my life, wrote one veteran. I hate cannon. And now artillery began to destroy townscapes as well. In the battle with the rebellious Paris Communards of 1871, the government guns tore down street after street, transforming the center of the French capital into a field of ruins, leaving us with images we might well associate with the devastation of the bombing of World War II. But it was during the First World War that artillery revealed its newfound power. A century of invention had turned Wellington's smooth-bore cannon into engines of mass destruction of every size. From the small field guns, like the British 18-pounder, and its French equivalent, the 75mm, which fired 20 rounds a minute, to the massive railway guns that could reach miles into the enemy's positions. Guns like these made the First World War truly an artillery war. The great trench offensives were preceded by bombardments of unparalleled weight and intensity. Before the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917, four and a quarter million shells were fired over 19 days. Even delivering such bombardments was an experience no gunners could ever forget. I don't think I have ever known anything as impressive as the opening of a really full-scale barrage. Suddenly, bang on zero hour, the whole place just comes alive with a terrific surge with all the shells that are traveling through the air. And away on the skyline, as far as the eye can see, right and left is absolutely lit up with pinpoints. A most impressive sight. Yet the gun crews rarely saw what their shells hit. It was the forward observers who witnessed the fall of shot. I remember when we were firing our ancient charters from Albert, and there's a village called Earls, which was more or less intact behind the German lines. It distressed me enormously because it's a very pretty little village uh, with houses on both sides of the road, and I only had to fire four rounds, one, two, three, four, to see the spire of the church collapse and the whole of the village flattened out. Four rounds only from our eight-inch houses. 
It was artillery that was the great killer of the First World War. It was also the great demoralizer. Soldiers of all nations loathed shellfire's arbitrary and impersonal character. A young British officer wrote, terror and death coming from far away seemed much more ghastly than a hail of fire from people we could see and with whom we could come to grips. It was a fatalistic situation. Imagine terrible weather, the ground outside turned to an impossible morass, uh, and the din, the noise, and the concussion uh, just making the air vibrate. You really felt, well, there's nothing we can do to escape. It's a question of time before your number's on the, on the bit that comes along. Artillery did not only destroy men, it also devastated the surface of the battlefield on which they moved and tried to survive. It turned farms and villages to heaps of shapeless rubble, fields to wasteland, forests to tangled heaps of brushwood. Above all, it turned the soil into mud, mud so deep and liquid that it swallowed horses and drowned men. This gentle slope is the rise that leads to Passchendaele, the tiny village outside Ypres, so long and savagely contested that its name has come to stand for the Holocaust of the First World War. This is how it looks today, and as it must have looked in 1914. But in the autumn of 1917, it had come to resemble the surface of the moon. This sequence of aerial photographs record how, as crater came to overlap crater during the relentless bombardment, houses, hedges, even field boundaries were progressively erased until Passchendaele existed only as a name on a map, a terrible tribute to the power that artillery exerts on the modern battlefield. At one o'clock in the afternoon, the Battle of Waterloo had been raging for two hours. It was at its fiercest here around Hougoumont, the old fortified manor house and farm standing just in front of the British right wing. Wellington had occupied it and loopholed it for defense. It's still an impressive building today. In 1815, it was even stronger and more extensive, extensive enough to contain nearly two battalions of British foot guards. Wellington had garrisoned it strongly because he thought its possession essential to secure his right wing. The French were equally keen to take it from him. Indeed, they opened the battle by an attack on Hougoumont, and the fight there quickly became a battle within a battle, persisting throughout the morning and afternoon. At one stage, the French actually broke into the central courtyard, but by sheer weight of numbers, the British were able to force the gate shut behind them. The intruders were then hunted down and every single one of them killed except a young drummer boy. Around the middle of the day, some of the buildings here were set on fire by shells from French howitzers, and this introduced another dimension of horror to the fighting in the farm. The roofs of the barn and the manor crashed in a sheet of flame on top of the wounded who were lying inside, and many of them were burnt to death. The whole of this courtyard was like an oven. Everyone was scorched by flying embers. The old manor house, which used to stand over there, burnt down in the end, and all that's left is this little chapel. But in spite of all this, and despite the ferocity and courage of the French attack, the walls of this courtyard were never breached. The wood outside was lost, the buildings often completely surrounded, but at the end of the battle, the foot guards were standing firm. Throughout history, it has always been a hard and bloody task to capture a fortified position from resolute defenders. To capture Malta in 1565, the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman, sent a mighty armada of 181 ships and an army of 30,000 men. The island was defended by 700 knights of St. John and 9,000 hired soldiers. Yet four months later, the Turks, who had lost two-thirds of their men in the siege, retired in ignominious defeat to Constantinople. 400 years later, American marines were brought in to recapture the city of Hue, Vietnam's ancient capital, seized by the North Vietnamese army in their Tet Offensive. In the heart of the city lies its citadel built by French colonial engineers in the 19th century and designed only to withstand gunpowder and round shot. Against it, the Americans deployed all the firepower of a mighty modern army.
despite these ferocious assaults, the defenders held out for 25 days behind the citadel's walls and moat, until in the end it was carried by the oldest of methods, direct assault by infantrymen. Well, I've been over here four months, and we were always in the rice paddies, in the jungles, patrols, something like that. This was something new. It's like broke into like any city, locks, uh, concrete buildings. And the thing was, you never know what's going to happen every time you turn the corner or every time you enter the building. We got in the habit of throwing grenades and firing first before we went anywhere. And in some instances, it was no more than five feet that you had to shoot, shoot the enemy or he was trying to shoot you. This went on building by building. We had to take it. There was no such thing as trying to clear a block out, you know, just with a platoon. We broke down the five-man teams. You know. It, it was just chaos, you know. Just whoever shot fastest made it, in which uh, quite a few did make it on our side, you know. Our job was to take the citadel. I can remember a huge wall around it. Uh, most of the city was taken at the time, but the citadel was left. say half of the company had serious enough wounds. The final count of men that were killed in my platoon were five out of my platoon alone. And I think out of our company, I believe it was 15. The Citadel finally fell, but the defenders had already slipped away. <laughs> 